Okay, so a couple of weeks ago on the homework, we had the question on VLS growth. So this is sort of hot off the press. A group was able to do transmission electron microscopy. That's the one we learned about two classes ago. That's TEM. That's the one that can do like a billion times magnification where you can see atoms. They not only did TEM, but they're able to do it as a function of time, and they're able to do it in a chamber at 400 degrees Celsius that has a liquid and a solid. None of this was possible not even that long ago. Just the idea that we could do TEM and we could see atoms was impressive. But here you see that they captured in situ, like meaning as it was happening, images of VLS depositing whatever this material is. I don't, I don't know what it is offhand, right? But you can see the, that it grows in these layers back and forth. So I think this is just a really cool tie into a concept we learned about, VLS, and you can see that it's a video of this TM happening in real time, which is pretty amazing. Okay? Okay. So let's pick up where we left off last time. The last thing we talked about was toughness. For a given stress-strain curve, we said that there's something called toughness and there's something called resilience. So the first thing we'll do today is talk a little bit more about that because we're a little bit rushed when we finished it last time. We're then going to talk about how do you test ceramics. This piece of chalk is a ceramic, and if I was going to do a tensile test on it, and I was going to clamp onto it and pull it apart, I'd break it as soon as I clamped onto it, right? So we need a better way, and there's something called a bend test, which we're going to use, right? We're going to talk about the mechanical response of materials as you change the temperature or the strain rate. We're going to get into non-Newtonian materials like polymers, um, including something called the glassy transition temperature, where polymers sort of transition from a ductile material to a brittle one. Um, and then we'll end with hardness. And if we have time, I'm going to tell you about some of my own research on discovering new super hard materials, which I, I'm just jazzed about. Okay? So the area under the curve, <clears throat> how do you figure out the area under the curve if it's a complex shape, right? If this was easy, if it was a shape that looked like this, then figuring out the area under the curve is pretty easy. You could do it geometrically, right? You could say, well, this looks like a triangle. And so it's just one half base times height, right? That would be one approach. You could also say, well, that looks like the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b. And you can integrate um, that line pretty easily, right? But what about the more complex realistic shapes here? How do we go about integrating that? How would you figure out the area under the curve? Maybe turn to a neighbor. How would you figure out that toughness? Okay, what do we think? Let me pick on Reagan. What do you think? You've got that funky shaped curve. What do you do with it? Okay, that's one option. That, that one's going to work pretty well. You could say this blue curve, it looks a lot like a straight line over here. So there we could use y equals mx plus b. What do you do for the rest of it? Yeah, fit it to some sort of polynomial. A quadrat a, a, to the fourth power would probably fit it pretty well. Fourth power as opposed to third because it starts coming up and then it goes down. So that's an even function. If you remember a polynomial function, that's an even one. And because it's flattened out on the top, a fourth order would probably fit that pretty well, right? So you could integrate from here to here for the first function, from there to there for the second. That's an option. What else could we do to this? Yeah, Ashton or Josh? Yeah, you could split it into geometric shapes. What else? Any, what's numeric integration? Anybody remember numeric integration? It's a shame that we don't talk more about this because it's pretty useful. Numeric integration is, these are data points, right, all along here? All these are data points, and they were probably collected at equal intervals, right? Therefore, numeric integration just says, take that, make a rectangle out of it. So this is kind of like what Josh was saying, make that, make a rectangle out of it. This is a crappy drawing, but you get the idea. You just take a bunch of small rectangles, right? You take the average between two points and the width between those points and you add those up, right? All of these would work to give you an approximate toughness, an approximate energy that gets absorbed, okay? Um, I didn't give you a homework on this, <clears throat> which means it won't show up on a midterm. But if you needed to do this, this is the approach that you'd take, okay? Okay.
All right. Um, materials that have been engineered to be tough don't typically rely on one class of materials only. They're oftentimes composites that have multiple classes. Um, we stole this from nature, right? The figure you're seeing here on the top, this comes from probably a, some sort of like clam or something. That's where I've seen these like, like this before. Essentially, a clam has been designed, right? Birds can pick it up and they can try and break it with their beak. So if they're not tough, they get eaten and they don't get a chance to reproduce, right? The ones that are tougher survive, right? And so nature has evolved these things to make very tough shells. In fact, the way that they break them is they fly up in the air and they drop them on hard rocks, and even that doesn't always break them. And the way that they have a high toughness is by combining a ceramic, a calcium carbonate, and then you have a layer of biopolymer between them. And by combining both the polymer and the ceramic, you get the hardness from the ceramic, which we'll talk about later today, but you get the elasticity of the polymer, and together, a crack can't travel through that directly, right? A crack is probably going to get deflected. It's going to move. It might do something like this as it travels through the material, <clears throat> which overall increases your toughness because you're making it harder for the crack to propagate through the material. So engineers, we've copied this idea. When I went to grad school, uh, the lab next door to me, they were doing this for armor applications for the military, right? They take ceramic plates, they take uh, very, the toughest they can polymers, they put them between them, they stack them up and they can make very tough uh, armor materials, okay? And some examples might look something like this, right? We've got a polyurethane resin, that's the polymer, and then maybe have a silicon carbide or something else as your, as your hard ceramic layer. Okay, speaking of ceramics, we've said that they're hard to test, right? If I were to clamp onto this, it would break. So instead, we do bend tests, right? And a bend test is just what it sounds like. You can take it like with your fingers and you could do it yourself, right? This is what's called a four-point bend test. I've got the two fingers on top, right? And then I've got the, my two thumbs on the bottom. And the separation distance that I choose will make this easier or harder to bend. For example, let's say I have my fingers really close together. I don't have a good torque arm, right? I have a low moment, bending moment, and it's going to be harder to break this thing. So, for example, breaking this small piece of chalk, if I can even do it, yeah, I don't know if I can break this. A bit, I have to really wrench on it. But breaking a large piece of chalk, especially if you, if you maximize the distance between the outer span and the inner span, is very easy to break, right? If you've taken statics, you guys are probably taking it already or taking it now. You've already learned about this, so I'm not going to reteach you statics. All I'm going to say is that bending test, the geometry matters, right? The distance between these points matters quite a bit. Now, three-point versus four-point, should there be a difference? Yeah, th there ought to be, right? <clears throat> so if you've done the reading, let's do a quick clicker question on this. The question is as follows. Will the bend strength, meaning the strength at which it actually fractures, will it be higher for three or four-point bending? So again, three-point bending looks like this. You've got one lower span and two upper spans or vice versa, right? One upper and two lower, same thing. Four-point bending looks like this. You've got two spans and two spans on the top and bottom. Which one will result in a higher strength? Meaning, which one appears to be stronger? The same material tested two different ways. Which one appears to be stronger? <coughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you get that graded before the end of class, remind me, and Carter sitting there next to Julia, we'll give it back to him. So one, two, three, four rows back in the middle with, with the glasses. Okay, get your answers in. Which one appears to be stronger? The same material, when you test it under three point or four point, which one appears to be stronger? Get your answers in. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, four point, most people think that four point bending appears to be stronger, and this is actually wrong, right? So I'll go back and make this worth participation only, since everyone's getting it wrong. And let's, let's figure out why is it that a three point bending material will appear to be stronger, okay? 
By the way, the bend strength is sometimes called the modulus of rupture, M-O-R, right? The modulus of rupture. And if you wanted to, you could calculate it. It would be based off of the force that you're applying, the distance between the spans, the dimensions of your sample. That's B and H. That's your width and height, right? But why will three-point bending appear to be a stronger material compared to four-point? It has to do with the bending moment. And if you've taken statics, you've seen this before, right? If you apply a force... You could divide the forces like so, which gives rise to a bending moment. If your span is in the very middle, the bending moment reaches a maximum in the middle, and then it goes down. Meanwhile, in a four-point bend test, when you balance it and you, and you generate the, four point, uh, the bending moment under four-point conditions, you reach a maximum at, at the first point, and then it's a constant bending moment all the way over. So here's the catch. The bending moment where it's maximized, that's where you're going to break, right? Because that's where you have the highest stress, right? So if you look at this, these materials have flaws statistically present in them. Like wherever this thing is where I broke it, right? This thing that I just broke, if I look at its surface, I might be able to see the flaw that caused it to break, right? When I flexed it, there was some maybe pore or a void or a crack or whatever was in it where it broke. And statistically speaking, you are more likely to find a flaw oops, over this larger volume than over this individual point, right? You're comparing a plane in your material that might have that flaw versus some big volume in your material, right? So if I was going to draw it, let's say that your flaw is like this big right here, and you've got just tiny ones here. Meanwhile, that same distribution... You can see that the big flaw is present under the large bending moment here, but the big flaw is not present under a large bending moment here. Therefore, this one might not break where this one would have broken. Therefore, your strength is going to appear to be lower for the four-point bending, and it's going to appear that you have a stronger material by three-point bending. Yeah, question in the back? So, would you get a higher maximum stress on the Correct. And therefore, you would think... So, so, say again? You, it, let's say you tested 20 samples. The average strength of those 20 samples will be higher for three-point bending than four-point bending. But you know that you made the samples the exact same way. It's just that your sampling volume is different in the two tests. So don't be confused if people say three-point, four-point. If, if, if you had a lab, for example, where you had to measure both and you made your material the exact same way, it would be incorrect to say, my three-point bending test samples are stronger. It's just that under the testing configuration, they failed at a higher stress. But there's nothing intrinsic about the material that made that set stronger. It's just how you tested it. Does that make sense? Doesn't sound convinced. Um, does it make sense, uh, this scenario, right, where you've got a big flaw... Okay. I'm, I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, would it create more of a bending stress at a three point so less weight would bend? I'm not sure that's a true statement. I think that's the difference. And I, it's been 15 years since I've taken static, so I'm not going to hazard the, the bending moment calculation. I'll leave that to your peers that know it better. Or if you want, I can come back tomorrow and we can go over it. But I think that's the difference, is that the bending moment is the same in the two scenarios. And I could be wrong about that, but I'll find out. Okay? Other questions about this? In, in general, this is a nice test to do. It's pretty easy. All you need is a sort of matchstick-shaped sample. You make a bunch of these things, and you flex them, and you, and you measure that modulus of rupture. You do need to make sure that they are coplanar, that they have nice, nice flat surfaces, that the width and the height does not vary. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty nice test to do. It's pretty easy, okay? All right. <clears throat> now, there's things that can change the properties of materials, the intrinsic properties. Uh, say, for example, porosity. If I had the same exact chalk but they didn't densify it completely when they made it, if it had lots of pores left over, it stands to reason it's going to fail at a lower stress, right? It's going to be a weaker material. But what else will change? Modulus and other things will also change, right? Um, so the modulus, the Young's modulus, is, this is an analytical expression. This is not a first principles calculation. But they've shown that if you had the fully dense material, that's E0 right here, 
But in the, in the not dense material where there's porosity left over, you can model what the modulus is by this expression, where P represents the fraction of pores present in your material, right? And different materials might have slightly different analytical expressions. But in general, adding porosity makes your material less stiff and a little bit more compliant, okay? Um, by the way, why does porosity get left over in materials when you make it? So I mentioned a little bit ago that there's these things called bubble rafts. Back in the 50s, material scientists were like, they were big fans of the bubble raft. And what you see here is they would take bubbles on the surface of some sort of liquid. They'd start out with them being separated, and then they would bring them together, right? So let's watch that again, right? So here you can see these things. They're separated. They release them from underneath. And then surface tension is going to bring these things together, right? You see them slowly coalescing. And they'll continue to coalesce in as much as they're able to. It relies on bubble motion, which we could relate to atomic motion. And the pores between them tend to get smaller if this goes to completion. But it's actually difficult to go all the way to completion. Like, this thing is going to be there at the end. You're going to have a pore left over where your particles didn't quite meet together, okay? That's a very common problem in ceramics, is trying to start out with a bunch of dirt particles, ceramic particles, right? You press it together the best you can, you heat it up, and you start letting them bond together, but getting it completely dense is a challenge, and there's whole fields, like this was my PhD, was trying to fix these problems, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about polymers for a minute. We started out this chapter, and I think a previous one, talking about the effect of temperature and strain rate, right? The banana, if you bend the banana quickly, it snaps and it looks kind of like a brittle material. If you bend it slowly, it deforms. If it's a cold temperature, it shatters. If it's warm, it, it deforms. Um, so you can really, on your stress versus strain curve, you can kind of tune your response based off of the strain rate that you choose and the temperature that you're testing it at, right? Here's a real example. This is PMMA. PMMA at a high temperature, 60 degrees Celsius, looks like rubber. It's, it's, it's flowing. It goes all the way out to 1.3 strain, right? So massive strain, over 100%, right? 130% strain. Meanwhile, if you test it at 4 degrees Celsius, almost freezing, that looks like a ceramic, right? So you can really get a wide range of properties, particularly in polymers. Um, other materials as well, it's just that polymers melt at low temperatures, that at temperatures that are low, you see big changes. Metals and ceramics might do this too, but it might be really high temperatures where you see that happening. Okay. Um, so during deformation, we're going to talk more about this next chapter. It's all about deformation mechanisms. But this is kind of what's happening. As you're pulling it, you'll notice that polymers tend to draw down, right? We talked about necking last class. This is kind of what's happening. Up here, there's no orientation. The polymers are a bowl of spaghetti. They're sort of random. But as you continue to pull on it and deform it, these things start to line up. They don't get perfectly lined up, but they're trending towards more lined up, right? You're changing the polymer chains, okay? That's gonna, we'll, we'll talk more about that next chapter. It has important implications. For example, which one of these would have the stronger tensile strength? If you had a, a, a polymer that was completely oriented like this versus that, which one would you expect to be a stronger ceramic, or polymer? No orientation or, or orientation? So in a nor orientation one, you're able to slide things past each other, and the only thing you have to break are van der Waals bonds between chains. Here, if you're going to keep on orienting it, you're going to have to start breaking covalent bonds along the chain. So this is going to be a much stronger polymer than the randomly oriented one. So if you're making Kevlar, and you can line up your Kevlar fibers, or have them oriented every which way, you probably want them lined up, because Kevlar is used because it is a high-strength polymer. Okay? All right, we talked briefly about anelastic behavior. Remember, what was anelastic behavior, anelasticity from last class? This was the fire ants, the strain to side on fire ants. Anelasticity says you apply a load, and then some time later, you see the deformation, right? Another word for this is viscoelastic, right? So take, for example, these two plots. The plot above, that's stress versus time. So maybe you didn't apply any stress, and then you immediately did, you hold it there, and you're not varying that stress, and then you immediately take it away. Well, your response in a viscoelastic material might look like this black line. At first, you'll see some instantaneous strain, and then your strain's going to continue to increase until it sort of plateaus, right? 
So in polymers, you might say that this is the initial strain, that the polymers that can slide past each other easily, that's your initial strain. But then as it continues to strain, that's the polymers that are harder to slide past one another. So they're, they're still sliding, but it's, it's getting harder and harder because they're all basically lining up there. That would be possibly one ex explanation of this. And then when you reduce the, the stress, take it back to zero, you see some instantaneous reduction in strain, but there's some that slowly kind of bleeds off. Okay? So that's viscoelastic behavior. And in polymers, it's, really, it's actually a really important phenomenon. Okay? Um, okay, the question that maybe we should talk about before we go on, since temperature and strain rate can both influence mechanical properties, how do we go about testing materials? How do we decouple them for study? Let me turn to your neighbor. How do we study polymers since both of these can influence properties? I should really add some gaps in my notes, bigger gaps, because it's right there, right? <clears throat> yeah, imagine if, uh, if you want to completely understand the mechanical response of materials, it would be wise to, to fix one temperature, for example, and then test a lot of different strain rates, right? That's what you saw in the PMMA example above. Here they presumably test all of these at the same strain rate, but a bunch of different temperatures. But you could go the other way too. You could say, in every case, we're going to stretch it at some constant rate, but we're going to change, or sorry, we're going to fix one temperature, but we're going, to, we're going to change the rate at which we stretch it. Right? You have to fix one and then you can vary the other. If you do that, <clears throat> you're able to fully characterize the mechanical properties of materials. Um, something that happens in polymers in particular is something called stress relaxation. Stress relaxation means that, let's say that you apply a stress on day one. I load a, um, a spoke on a motorcycle, right? If this is made out of a material that undergoes stress relaxation, I, I load it up to some megapascal loading. But then a week later, I test it, and it's relaxed, and it's no longer at, say, 10 megapascals. It's been reduced to 1 megapascal. This happens because the polymers sliding past each other that we've talked about. As they slide past each other, they can... They, you don't need as much strain, or you don't need as much stress because it's straining, right? So what happens is we need an expression that shows us what stress does as a function of time. So this is our stress relaxation equation. If you load a polymer with some initial stress, that's sigma naught, right? This is your initial stress right there. If you know the Young's modulus of your material, you know the time that it's going to be loaded, and you know the viscosity, that's eta, this guy, which we'll talk about next chapter, then you can calculate what the stress will be at any time, right? A year later, 10 days later, an hour later. You can calculate what the stress will be in that material as it slowly relaxes, right? So this is much more prominent in polymers, right? We don't talk about stress relaxation in metals because they don't typically strain nearly as much as polymers do as a function of time. So we will come back to this when we talk about viscosity next chapter. Um, just introducing that it exists for right now. In general, when you characterize a polymer, you create what's called a glassy transition curve. The glassy transition curve shows your modulus. This might be the elastic modulus. It could also be the shear modulus, right? It's your stiffness as a function of temperature, right? So you might have a material which at low temperatures is a very stiff material. It's like a glass, right? But this glassy material, as you transition, right, your glassy transition temperature is going to be somewhere in this region. It's going to now become a leathery material, maybe a rubbery one. It might even start to flow until it looks like a liquid. Your modulus changes. But the key here is that in most polymer materials, it's not a straight line. It's not a linear relationship. It has these plateaus, right? You start out as a glass. You spend some significant region where it's now kind of a rubber and then eventually it flows like a liquid, right? So this is your glassy transition temperature, and you get this by doing these decoupled experiments, right? You can see here, right? So here's a bunch of different measurements of modulus, okay? <coughs> these are done at different temperatures. <laughs> Excuse me. Different temperatures, and they figure out what the modulus is at each of these different temperatures, and then they've mapped it over here. <coughs> I'm joking. <coughs> okay? So that's the glassy transition temperature, the glassy transition curve, okay? The glassy transition temperature does have a specific definition. It is defined as when the viscosity has a very specific value of 10 to the 12th Pascal seconds. 
Again, we will talk about viscosity next chapter, but it's essentially a measure of how thick a liquid is. Water is a very thin liquid, but if you've used motor oil, different motor oils are designed to have different viscosities, like 10W40, 10W30. These different numbers often relate to how thick that material is, so we need to measure that thickness. It might be like honey, where it flows really slowly. It might be like water, right? Viscosity is the measure of that, of that resistance to shear, okay? Um, so we can change our, our glassy transition curve if we modify our polymer. So let's do the following, right? We're going to sketch our glassy transition curve. Again, this is something like modulus as a function of temperature. We're going to sketch it for four different polymers. There's our, our regular polymer that we just saw, which does something like this. We can take that polymer and we can cross-link it. And if we cross-link it, it will never flow. It's always going to stay together, right? If you heat up a polymer that's not cross-linked, eventually the chains will slide past each other. It'll melt, right? But if it's cross-linked or a covalent structure, it never will. It will still become rubbery, but then it will never flow. So we lose the liquid flow regime. Our cross-linked one would just keep on at the rubbery limit, maybe, right? You can take um, isotactic versus atactic. The difference here... Isotactic means that all the side groups are on the same side. Atactic means it's random. Which one should have a higher melting point? Turn to your neighbor. Like, which one... If these are isotactic and atactic, which one is which of those two curves? Okay, which one's which? What do I draw my arrows to? Which one would be isotactic? Which one would be atactic? And why? What's your rationale? This is an easy test question, right? Because it's going to take, you'll either know it or you won't. It won't take much time. Well, what's the difference between an isotactic and an atactic structure? It's just that the side groups are all on one side. So one of them looks like it melts at a lower temperature. Which one should have the lower melting point? This one clearly becomes a liquid before this one does. Atactic versus isotactic, which one melts at a lower temperature and why? In the back. Isotactic should melt higher or lower? I think higher. What's the reason? So how about this? Let me ask this one. Which one of them is able to stack closer together? If you've got a big side group on both sides, you can't stack them close together. If it's all just on one side, you can stack them together nicely. And the closer the chains get to each other, we know from Coulombic attraction, right, even if it's a small difference in charge, it's, it's proportional to 1 over r squared. So the closer you get them, the bigger the attractive force. So isotactic would be right here. Atactic would be there. Okay? <clears throat> and then a crystalline polymer, technically, we could also draw. It might look like this. That even when it undergoes its rubbery plateau, it's at a higher modulus than the other ones, because it's crystalline. So it's a more, we've talked about the reasons why that leads to higher, it's basically the same reasons before. The same force that holds it together keeps it stiffer as well, okay? Um, if it's a crystalline, not cross-linked polymer, it would probably do that, okay? It would still melt at some point. Um, there's something called viscoelastic creep. Um, viscoelastic creep is really just uh, a consequence of uh, of stress relaxation. This is the reason that you put like flat, uh, flat stoppers on your car. If you have like a motor home or something that's not going to be driven very often, you put flat stoppers on it because technically this tire, even though we cross-link it lightly, it will flow over time, right? If there's a stress on it, the weight of that car is sitting on those tires and you let it sit for long enough, it's going to slide polymer chains in such a way that it minimizes stress, right? It's going to try and strain to reduce that overall stress, which might give you flat spots in your tire. Therefore, you put something rigid so it keeps its shape and you don't end up with flat spots in your tires, which is not going to be good. Okay? Then the last thing that we're going to cover before um, I tell you about my research is hardness. Hardness is an interesting property because it's defined lots of different ways. In the old days, they had what's called the Mohs hardness scale, and like geologists would do this. They literally had a box with 10 different minerals. I'll show you that. It's bizarre that this is actually what they did. They had a box 
and they would say, okay, in my box, I've got these different minerals, and you just scrape things. You say, when I'm out in the field doing whatever geologists do, right, you find an unknown mineral, you start trying to scrape it, and you say, ah, talc is way too soft. I can't scrape it with talc. This is climbing chalk, by the way, talc. Very, very soft, right? But fluorite can scrape it. My fingernail can't scrape, or can, cannot scrape it. Neither can a but fluorite can. Therefore, you know the hardness is in this region. So this is totally just a comparative scale, which is why it's kind of not useful these days, but people still talk about it. But this is how they initially did hardness. So we realized that we needed a better way to do hardness than carrying around a box full of objects and trying to scrape things. So now we scrape things, but we do it in a controlled fashion. Here's how it works. You take a tip. <clears throat> you have your material, which is flattened. You, you polish it so it's nice and flat. And you just dent it, right? You take this tip, you apply a very careful, known load. The geometry of the tip is well known. In some cases, it's a diamond, sort of like a pyramid shape. In some cases, it's just a hemisphere, right? And so the different hardness tests that you might have heard were, like, like a Rockwell hardness, or a Vickers hardness, or a Noop hardness, the only difference between these is the shape of the head, or maybe the uh, type of material. These are often tungsten carbide tips. This is usually diamond, right? But it's really just a different type of tip that you're denting your material with. You then remove the tip and you measure the indentation. You either measure how deep it went into it, or you look at it afterwards and you say, okay, I can measure these distances, and that will give you a measure of hardness. Why do we care about hardness? Uh, obviously, some things you don't want to scratch, but also because hardness, so if, you, if you're developing material that you just want to be scratch resistant, hardness has its own reason to be investigated. But another reason why we like hardness is that it's a good, non-destructive, easy th proxy for other properties that we do care about. For example, yield strength. There's a pretty well, for different class of material, there's pretty well-known expressions that relate hardness to yield strength. Doing yield strength tests is a pain in the butt. You gotta load it in the Instron, you break it for one thing, and you have to test lots of these things. Whereas if you make a sample, polish it, you can indent these things, and these are tiny, tiny, tiny indentations. Oftentimes you can't see them with your eye, with the naked eye, right? So you could test a hundred different spots, and your material is not broken, it's just, it's, it's fine to go, right? So it's a nice test for that reason, in that it's a proxy for other properties we care about. In fact, some groups even do this. They'll, they'll measure it, they'll test it, and they'll see cracks form, right, like that. Let me pull up a picture. So, Vickers hardness uh, fracture. You can actually look at the cracks that form and measure those. Um, and here's the schematic right here, right? Here they use the diamond tip, the pyramid that's made out of diamond. They pressed it in, and then they measured the length of cracks that form, and you can actually get fracture toughness as a proxy out of this. Now, there's some criticisms of this technique, but it's, it's certainly a correlation to the, the fracture toughness, even if it's not a really carefully known exact value. So this is a powerful technique, um, hardness. <clears throat> so I want to show you a couple of things from my own research on hardness, because I think it's rad. Um, in my group, we're all about discovering new materials. Mankind has been around for many, many, many millennia, and we've been trying to make harder uh, materials, stronger materials, better materials in lots of different ways. And one of the things that I talked about in my talk, as my, my cartoon gives away here, is, um, is I think that we can use big data to discover materials much faster, right? And if you've paid any attention at all, you've seen big data is like all around us. By the way, I gave this talk at BYU and left this slide up. My wife, <laughs> my wife suggested I not do that. It went over uh, about as well as you'd expect, right? <laughs> So I'm, I'm not going to give you the whole slide show. I'm just going to show you a couple slides. But um, machine learning, which is learning from large data sets, is all around us. You see terrifying, exciting, novel, crazy, unimaginable headlines all the time. Take this one. They trained off of websites. They looked at your profile picture. They grabbed it. They took down as the labeled data whether you were interested in dating a male or a female. Now they've got a labeled data set of whether you're gay or not. They've sped it in hundreds of thousands of faces through a convolutional neural net, and out comes a prediction from anybody's face whether they're gay or not. And they claim they had 90% accuracy. There's some criticism of the study, obviously for ethical reasons. <laughs> you can imagine a parent downloading this and like checking their kids. Like, there's some major problems with this study, but um, but the fact is these things exist, and they're not going away. Take this one. This is from the New York Times a few months ago. Convolutional neural net, again, it starts with random noise, 
you train it off a bunch of real faces, now you feed it random noise, it goes through the net, and out comes faces. So the question is, which one's real and which one's fake? It's a trick! They're both fake, right? Neither, like, these are both fake. So convolutional nets are really, really impressive. You can do the same thing with street images. So this is Google street images collected in the Alps. They then take random noise, feed it through the algorithm. This is not the Alps. This is a fake computer-created, they call it computer dreaming, right? This is, this is not a real image. This is the power of machine learning. So the point is that it's all around us. All I'm going to say uh, before I dive in, because I've only got 15 minutes. Actually, I've got 15 minutes. Let me tell you a little bit about it. That's terrific. Um, as a material scientist like myself, I am passionate about discovering new materials, but it is not working very well, right? <laughs> Trying to discover new materials turns out to be really hard. In fact, so it's fascinating. In different classes, whether it's the best battery or the best thermoelectric or the best superconductor, whatever it is, oftentimes the best material is one of the ones that was discovered early on. And then everyone afterwards, dis they, we do tons of investigations, but we're not rapidly discovering new materials. So this is the number of publications in a few of the energy-related fields, which is typically where I work. And there's something like 10,000 publications per year, and it's growing at an exponential rate. So even when I ask my peers that I know really keep on top of the literature and read a lot of papers, they're not reading 10,000 papers a year. I bet they're reading 200 a year. So what do we do with this massive, massive amount of data that's being generated, right? Computer science and other fields are really getting a hang of it, right? The reason that Netflix can predict, you know, it sees that I watch seven series of Battlestar Galactic, and it's like, you might like Firefly. And I'm like, you're darn right I do, <laughs> right? <laughs> They've figured it out. They know how to take advantage of the massive amount of data of people like me that watch all these shows on Netflix and they can train off of it. Um, but we're not doing that very well in material science. We're publishing a lot of data, but we're not collecting it in ways that we can apply machine learning. And so that's what I'm doing in my group. So... Um, Here's further evidence that it's not working. There's something called thermoelectrics. We're going to talk about these later in chapter 12. They, they essentially take waste heat, convert it to electricity, right? Which would be pretty rad, because there's waste heat like all around us. Like our bodies are producing waste heat, right? So if we could grab some of this, turn it into electricity, that'd be better. And the metric that will allow that to happen better, more efficiently, is ZT. And if you look at ZT over time, over the last 50 years, it basically it was flat. And in the last 15 years, we've seen a rise because there's 10,000 papers a year on this. But it's, if you look at the average, it's actually going down. We're actually getting worse at discovering new thermoelectrics. The average is going down. It's the exceptions, the accidents, the happy mistakes, the, the luck, the serendipity, whatever you want to call it, it's the exceptions that are getting better. It's usually not like they set out and they said, oh, this crystal system or this dopant or this microstructure should have this. That happens sometimes. It's oftentimes the grad student made it and they messed up and they made the wrong thing and they made it and they're like, hey, this is, this is pretty great. Right? I'm not kidding. This happens. Superconductors, high temperature superconductors. A, a lot of these things were happy mistakes. Super glue. All these things were mistakes. And so we need a better way to discover materials. And so my whole spiel being here at the University of Utah, is that instead of the traditional approach where you look in the literature, you say, aha, my colleague who I know does good work, they're looking at this system, but they haven't tried switching out this atom with that one, or they haven't changed the grain size, I'm going to do that. I come up with a design experiment, I test it. That's what is, I'm calling the traditional approach. This leads to local optimization. Right? You're not going to get breakthroughs by looking at what everyone else has done and just tweaking it a little bit. What I think you need is a way to look at totally different classes of materials, mixtures of atoms that you never thought to look at, but it's too high risk to do that. Every experiment that I ask Logan to do for me, how long does, it, does an experiment take you? A long time. It's horrible. It's months sometimes. And that's for one test, maybe. So I can't just pick compositions out of a hat and say, test them all. We don't have the time and resources. So instead, why don't we train off of data in the literature, things that work and don't work, we build an algorithm that can then predict things, and I say, Logan, try these things, because statistically speaking, they are probably more likely to be what we're looking for. That's the data mining approach that I'm going to describe. So I'm going to give you just one example, because we've talked about hardness materials. I'm going to talk about super hard materials, and somewhere under LA right now is Nanny. This is Elon Musk's machine for boring holes underneath Los Angeles, right? If you haven't heard about this, look it up. It's kooky. Um, why do we care about super hard materials with Nanny? Because it's cutting through rock. You're not using tool steel to do that. These cutting inserts on the tip of this are super hard materials. If you're going to cut rock, 
right? You can't scratch rock without something that's harder than it, so you need what's called a super hard material. These are materials that have a hardness value, a Vickers hardness, remember that's just a type of head that we use, over 40 gigapascals. That's really hard, right? So there are super hard materials known today. Here's one of them. It's diamond, right? The problem with using diamond as a cutting tool is obvious when you think about the cost that we're putting these on our fingers because we're we don't have a priority straight as human beings. <laughs> it's a much better engineering material than it is a wedding material, if you ask me. My wife disagrees, right? But you have you have these things. And the problem with, with carbon is twofold. First off, you can't cut steel with it because the carbon and the iron react to form iron carbide. Cementite, our old friend, and it chips off, so it ruins your diamond cutting tool. And cutting steel is pretty important, right? Because we use steel everywhere. The other problem with it is that this is in uh, Provo, Utah. This is U.S. Synthetic. Anybody work there? My last uh, master's. Do you work at U.S. Synthetic? <clears throat> They're both companies. Basically, almost like 60% of the diamond cutting tools in the world come from Utah. Who knew, right? There's two big companies, U.S. Synthetic and Mega Diamond. Um, and when they make them, you've seen this before. This is what's called a cubic anvil press. To press diamond powder, which is cheap, we know how to make cheap diamond powder. We're not going to use big gemstones. To press that diamond powder into a cutting tool, you've got to densify it. We already showed you the video on sintering. Remember like that process where like the bubbles came together? Doing that with diamond is a nightmare because it melts at like 3,000 degrees or something. So these happen at extremely high temperatures and they squeeze on it with ginormous pressure, something like 10 gigapascals in that neighborhood, and they take it up over 2,000 degrees Celsius. And because of that, this machine is expensive. Um, I don't know about Mega Diamond. U.S. Synthetic has 100 of these things. That's a person for scale. They have 100 of them in their plant and they're running around the clock, just around the clock to produce these things. It's a very expensive process. The goal, the holy grail would be new materials that don't require pressure. What if you just melted it? We could arc melt something with a $5,000 arc melter and you get a super hard material. That would be the holy grail. So that's what we got an NSF grant to uh, look at. <clears throat> I have a little bit of time still. And so we started trying to find new materials. There's alternatives to diamond. Take these two. Those are both still the diamond cubic structure. But what have we done? We've swapped out some of the atoms. It's not pure carbon anymore. Now they've put some boron in there, sprinkled some nitrogen in there, and you get a material that's not as good as diamond, but pretty darn good. These have a Vickers hardness of 50 and 76 gigapascals, respectively. Very hard. These are super hard materials, okay? But they also require high pressure. So we basically asked this question. Can we use machine learning to help predict new super hard materials? And here's what we did. We know that super hard materials, well, hard materials... The, the, the dashed line here, that's our super hard threshold, 40 gigapascals. All the materials that are super hard are also incompressible. This is our bulk modulus. We've talked about, bulk and, we've talked about elastic modulus and shear modulus. What's bulk modulus? If you squeeze on something rather, if you squeeze on it like uniaxially, you're going to get the elastic modulus. If you squeeze on it isostatically, meaning from all directions, all directions at once, the whole thing's going to shrink a little bit. And the constant of proportionality that tells you how much it shrinks, that's your bulk modulus. Or in other words, it's your incompressibility, right? It's how compressible your material is. All materials that are super hard are also incompressible, no duh. But the other way is not tr true, right? Osmium is extremely incompressible, but it's not super hard, right? So it needs another factor. We need it to be both incompressible as well as rigid. And next chapter, we're going to talk about dislocation motion, deformation mechanisms. Turns out... There's lots of ways to deform osmium, but there's not a lot of ways to deform diamond. So you need both incompressibility and rigidity. So we've got the two things that we're going to predict. Just like if it's Netflix, they're going to predict, you know, what's Elias' favorite cartoon? What's his favorite movie, right? We can predict both those things if we have enough data. We're going to predict incompressibility and rigidity, and here's how we're going to do it. You could look to literature and you could say people measure these things, but it turns out to be a holy nightmare to measure. I know because we've now had to do it. It's horrible to measure these things but people can calculate it, right? If you have a crystal structure and you know what atoms are there, you can simulate incompressibility and rigidity. And there's a company, <clears throat> it's not a company, it's a nonprofit called Materials Project that does this. The downside is that there's around half a million compounds that have been made before. Unique crystal structures, compositions, about half a million that have been made. Just inorganic materials. I'm, I'm skipping all the organic molecules. Then it would be like millions and millions, okay? about a half a million different things that might be super hard materials. We definitely have not tested all these things. So we'd like to screen for them. The problem, they've only calculated the elastic constants, right? The elastic tensor, they've only calculated it for 5,000. 
And it gets even worse. Because these are computational material scientists, not real-world material scientists, they make up structures. They imagine some kooky structure which doesn't ex actually exist in nature, and they still measure its properties. So we knew that this was the idea. Could we train off of this data, build an algorithm, and then predict all the half a million? Right? If we rely on this stuff, can we do it? So this, I'm going to step, take you through the process of machine learning. The first step to any machine learning process is you clean up your data. You say, all right, there's 5,000 entries, but half of those correspond to made-up structures, ones that don't have an analog in an existing crystal structure database. So we threw them out. We didn't include them. That left us with about 2,500, where you have both bulk and shear modulus. Then you need what's called a descriptor. I know this is not what you thought you'd be learning about today, but bear with me. It's, it's rad, I think. Descriptors are things that correlate with your target. So if I'm trying to predict people that are over six feet tall in this room, but I can't measure your height, well, what information do I have about you? How about gender, ethnicity, uh, your weight, your shoe size, your belt size? All of these things, if I get enough of them, I will have a really good model that can predict who's over six feet tall, right? You can imagine why. Like, weight clearly scales with it. Uh, gender has some bias with it. So that's what we're going to use. We need things that aren't like physical, like person descriptors. We need chemical descriptors. So for any given chemical formula, we can spit out a, fear, a, a series of features, or sometimes called descriptors. And it's things like you might expect. It's like volume per atom, the density, you know, the number of outer electrons. It's stuff like that. So there's hundreds that we could choose from. We figure out which ones matter the most, and we use a model on those. You then have to select a machine learning algorithm. You might have heard of some of these before, like a random forest. You've used them before because you've, you've all used a linear regression. And a linear regression is just a very simple machine learning algorithm. There's SVRs, there's random forests, there's gradient boosted regressions. Doesn't matter. These all are doing a similar thing in different ways. They're all taking features which, which, uh, which scale with the target that you're interested in, and they develop a model for predicting it. <clears throat> You then have to validate your model. So shown here are two curves. The one on the left is the predicted bulk modulus versus what the real values were. So you hold some of your data out. You have the model build itself. And then you have it predict the values that you held out, and you compare them. If it gets it perfectly right, all your data would be on a 45-degree line. So we don't have a perfect model. We have a pretty good model. Netflix will sometimes tell me, check out, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, no. The, like Stargate, whatever it's called. And I'm like, no, I just don't like Stargate. I get it that I should, but I just don't. Or Doctor Who, like, I don't know who likes that show. I get it that you think I will, but I just don't. It's getting it wrong, right? Maybe some of you, I'm sorry to Doctor Who lovers. Okay? With this, the, the power of this technique, as opposed to calculating these properties, is that once we have a, an effective model, we predicted over 100,000 compounds, even really nasty ones, if you were going to, like, materials project to calculate these things, it would take weeks for a single sample. We did 100,000 in 30 seconds on my cheesy laptop. And here's what we find. I know we're almost out of time. So here's increasing rigidity versus increasing incompressibility. We know that super hard materials should be over here. And so we zoom in and we look at these things. And sure enough, cubic boron nitride, it's already there. But there's two compounds that nobody's ever made before. And I'm going to skip the validation because we're out of time. And I'll just say that when we test these things, we make a bunch of little indents in different loads. At low loads, we're just over 40 gigapascals. So the reason why I want to say this is that um, in all of your fields, it's not that big data is the solution to every single field, but the solution is to think outside the box. When I started here at University of Utah six years ago, I told my colleagues I was going to do stuff like this, take data, use it to inform how I discover new materials, and I got more than one eye roll, right? I got a lot of skepticism, because it's a new and it's a unique approach. In all of the fields where you guys go on to work, you'll have the opportunity to toe the line and do what's always been done, or take an entirely new approach. And my suggestion, and thanks for bearing with me, is, is to do the latter. It, consider entirely new approaches and change the paradigm with the field that you're working in. Okay, thanks for paying attention again. <clears throat>